Hi everyone, my name is Abriza Jaws and I currently work as an internal medicine trainee in the United Kingdom at Dareford Hospital. I am currently in my second year of training, but I distinctly remember that when I started out of training last year, how confusing the portfolio was. So I thought it'd be a really good idea if we do a walkthrough of the NHS e-portfolio for internal medicine training. So the sections we're gonna to discuss today are setting up your profile, selecting your post, supervisors, and tutors, the IMT curriculum, managing your personal library and logbook, what are assessments or tickets, how to send a ticket, how to do a reflection, your summary of progress, how to link your e-learning to your e-portfolio, and finally, how to be an external assessor. Alrighty guys, so from Google, let's say we just type in NHSE portfolio, and there it is, the NHSE portfolio login. So your login will be given to you by your deanery and you set up your password accordingly, and mine's already saved here, so I'll just go ahead and click it and log in. As you can see here is the full portfolio. It's pretty sleek looking. They've done some nice little updates and it looks real good. So what we're gonna talk about first is setting up your profile. So if you go right over here, it says profile and we'll go to your personal details. Your personal details are basically your name, your GMC number, if you're enrolled and the email address that you want everything sent to when you are doing these things. And so that you know if a ticket's been done, um, if somebody else sends you a ticket and what have you. Then you've got your photo. It's not mandatory, but I think it's a really good idea to put up a nice photo of yourself so that whoever is completing an assessment can link your face to a name or a name to a face, and then there wouldn't be any sort of confusion. And then basically your login details, any communication preferences to what you have. Alrighty, after that, let's think about selecting your post supervisors and your tutors. If you go right next to that, you see that it has your post and supervisor details. So I've got a couple of posts here because I've already rotated a bit as the time has passed, but let's say you're starting out and you need to put in the information related to who your educational supervisor is, your clinical supervisor, your program director, and your tutors. So let's click edit here. And as you can see here, um, you're, how much of you know percentage work you're doing, if you're working 100% or if you're less than full time, what your grade is, the start and ending date of your rotation, and then I'm in my second year at Dareford Hospital. Go next, and what they're concerned about here is what specialty you are in. So I am in cardiology. If you are in something else or you need to add one or two things, basically you would just click it, goes to the right. If you accidentally put something there, click it back, and it goes across. And then we go on to next, and you will be putting in for your supervisors. So. Make sure you know exactly what their title is before you start searching and listing them. You will have an educational supervisor and you will have a clinical supervisor. Your educational supervisor typically stays with you throughout the year. It may even be longer than that if you don't rotate hospitals, but your clinical supervisor will change from whatever department you go to. So, you know, look down here, educational, clinical, and what have you. Let's say we're having it as a clinical supervisor for your location. I like to try and be as specific as possible. So what I end up doing is from Peninsula, I find Plymouth Hospitals and then click Dareford Hospital. And then I'll type in the name and the supervisor's name will come up here. Make sure it says CS. And just as before, you click it and then you press this button and it'll come across and you'll have a list of all the individuals who can then see your portfolio. If you do not list them here, they will not have access to your portfolio. And then you click finish. And then to just to double check to make sure you have everything where it should be, look here again. Second year, I am year two in program at Dareford in the cardiology department from here to here, all of your supervisors, and that is it. Now let's talk about your curriculum in IMT. So if you see here, you've got this lovely little tab, click it, and it says internal medicine training. We click it and what we see here are competencies. You've got generic competencies in practice, clinical competencies in practice, and your practical procedural skills. So if you just click this little folder, 
you'll get a better idea of what this all comes out to. I've put in a lot of stuff that I've linked in, which I'll talk about in a bit, so it seems really cluttered. So I think a really good way for you to be able to see it is if we look at the IMT ARCP decision aid. Okay, so this decision aid essentially will cover all the things that you need to know as you progress through your training at different levels. Um, your supervisor's reports, your, you know, your capabilities in your practice, your generic ones and your clinical ones as well as any consultant reports and then how much you need to have as you progress. So for instance, if you see here for your supervised learning events for your ACATS or your acute care assessment tool, they want you to ideally have four done for the first year and then four the next and then four after that. Doesn't mean you should only do four, try and do as many as possible so that you can show how well-rounded you are in different approaches and different things that you're seeing. Um, and then of course, any recording of any clinical activity patients that you've seen and then your different departments, what you've learned how to do, and then your practical procedural skills related to things that you need to know how to do just enough to be basically skills in a supervised setting or in a lab setting, or things that you need to be able to do completely unsupervised by the end of your training, and things that you would obviously have to keep knowing how to do, okay? What you really need to paying attention to is when you see here is the level of descriptors. So in, in your first year of IMT, there are a lot of twos, which means that they want you to be entrusted to act with direct supervision. As you progress through your training, you'll see a lot of these numbers will start changing. They'll want you to be able to do stuff with indirect supervision. And then finally, in your last year, you'll see there's even something that you want to be able to do completely unsupervised. So once you keep these goals in mind, you'll know what you need to work towards and how you can go ahead and do these things. So that's how it came there for the generic SIPs, the clinical ones again, linked, and then your practical procedural skills. And that's what you need to know related to your curriculum. Beyond that, if you think about how you will present things and how you show these things, if you look at the internal medicine stage one curriculum that's on the JRCPTB website, this will give you a little bit of a guidance if you're confused about what things you can show in different departments. So for instance, if you're in the cardiology department, you may see patients who are presenting with breathlessness or chest pain, or you might find individuals who've come in with different types of diseases like hypertension or valve disease, cardiac failure. That doesn't mean you have to find every single thing that's listed here, nor does it mean that you can't find things that are beyond the scope of, of this, you know, of this chart. But it's a good template for you to know like what to look out for. So once you're starting out, let's say if you're in geriatric medicine, so what you can do is as you follow the guidelines here, or you can see all the things that are listed here, you can think about utilizing these topics as things for your case-based discussions or your mini clinical examinations or for your ACATs. And they can help you at least keep an eye out for what you need to do. So the reason that there's such a good variety and why you should utilize this variety is if you are seeing you know, patients in the respiratory department, a lot of patients will come in breathless, but that doesn't mean every patient that you see during that time, you shouldn't have a CBD or a mini kex for every single patient being breathless. You can look for other things like hemoptysis or any wheeze, patients who are coming with asthma or pneumothorax. Try and choose this or use this as a, as a way that you can just find a little bit of something different to see. It won't always necessarily mean that you have to see these patients within the hospital. They can even be in a clinic setting. Um, especially if you're not in every single department that is listed here, it'll give you a nice, well-rounded portfolio. So for instance, even if in your first year, you're only in, let's say, hematology, geries, and um, gastro, but you go to endocrine clinics or you go to a dermatology clinic, you can add in those things that you've seen there so that you can show that you are well-rounded in that aspect. All right, let's move on to our next section. Now, the place you can shine the most and brag about all of your awesomeness is your personal library. This is where you can upload a lot of information to show and then link back in order to meet your curriculum items. So you can see here that there is a library, has a lot of little bits here about your audit, ARCP exams, any leadership stuff you've done, and your logbook. See here in your logbook, you've got a calculator. This calculator or your logbook here for your clinics or any cute takes that you've seen and the patients that you've seen. Remember earlier when I was talking about this stuff here, the patients that you can see here, you can also list any interesting cases in your logbook, again, to show the variety of patients that you have seen throughout your year. Please make sure you exclude any patient identifying kind of information like their name, date of birth, or any hospital ID or NHS number. Just kind of keep it really simple and generic in the sense that this type of an individual came in with these symptoms, and then you can go ahead and link them as per your curriculum item, 
and find what it is important to what you have said or done in that case. And then if you have any confusion about how it might relate, you can just click here and it'll give you a little bit more of an explanation so you can know if that's something that you want to talk about further. Okay, so that is in relation to your logbook and then of course any other documents you want to upload of things that you've gotten, like for instance, I put a thank you note here, any feedbacks you've gotten from any other people, and then you essentially just have to upload a file Put in the file here, select it, and give a description of what this all entails, and then you can link it, and you are set. All right, I've talked a lot about these supervised learning events, like your case-based dis discussions and your mini kexes. So when you've gone ahead and done this, you're going to be wondering, well, now how do I prove that I've had this discussion or that I've done this task? And that's where we come to your assessments. If you see here, it talks about ticket requests. A lot of times you'll do something and your registrar and your consultant will be like, go ahead and send me a ticket. And this is what they're talking about. So let's go ahead and check out your ticket requests. So the first thing you want to make sure that you're in the correct post you go ahead and you create a ticket. Again, double check you're in the correct post and see the different types of tickets that you can send. They can be an acute care assessment tool or an ACAT, your case-based discussion or your CBD, DOPS, mini kexes, and then multiple consultant reports, MSFs, or your multi-source feedbacks. So let's say for an instance, in this situation, we're gonna be sending a CBD to someone. All right, so I go ahead and click that Go next, type in the email address of the individual you want to send it to. So for right now, I'm just going to pretend I'm sending it to myself. Okay, click next and some information will come up and you'll give your comment for the assessor. What you're doing here essentially is you're refreshing the memory of the individual that you've had this discussion with or you've done this task with. So for your case-based discussion, let's say you'll say, Oh, a 90, you know, a 90 year old female was admitted with shortness of breath on exertion, no cough, but was pyrexic, also was complaining of some abdominal discomfort. Paramedics found that she was in fast AF. So now you've kind of given a scene. You're talking about what this patient has. You can also talk about some relevant, maybe some past medical history. For instance, maybe the patient has bronchitaxis or hypertension. And then you can talk about the investigations you did. Perhaps you did a chest x-ray, you took some bloods, you did an ECG. All right, you can see how this all then relates back here to what kind of a patient do you think that could be towards? Oh, oh, we already talked about breathlessness. So is there a chance that maybe this patient could have had some chest pain or anything that related to cardiac failure or anything related to edema, hypertension that could be causing this situation? You come back here, you think about it, you relate it in your CBD, and then you talk about this is what you did, this is what your plan was for the patient, and this is how you approach them. And all the things related to that so that you can then see what needs to be done. It could be this is the first time you've seen a presentation of a septic patient who then presents with fast AF. So you can talk about, you know, how it was tricky to not only treat the patient for an underlying infection, but also to make sure you were taking care of their fast AF. So those are two new aspects perhaps that you've not normally dealt with in medicine that you can then discuss in your CBD. You would then click finish, but I'm just going to click cancel for the sake of this situation. And what will happen then is it'll come up down below. All right. You'll see three things here that you need to be concerned about. You've got your expiry. It tells you how long it'll be until it goes. You've got the individual who's, who you've sent it to, and it'll tell you about the item itself. So an X means it's not been done yet. A tick means it's been done. And then you can check the actions. If, for instance, it's been a while and the individual still's not done it, you can click this and it'll send them a reminder to please complete it. If the expiry date has passed, don't worry. What you just do then is click copy and it'll copy all the details and you can resend it without a problem. So that is related to sending a ticket. Beyond that, guys, if you just look through here, it's pretty self-explanatory re related to DOPS or MSFs or patient surveys, QIs, and what have you. But really, I think the most important part of this would be your tickets request. If you want to see all the tickets that you've sent in one place, you can just go to your summary overview Click the time period that it's related to and you can know what you've done. Now, how many times have you all heard someone say to you, oh, you should really reflect on that? And you wonder to yourself, what is this reflection? How am I supposed to reflect on something? Well, reflections are a really important part of your practice because at least in my opinion, it helps make you a better doctor because it helps you approach something in, in maybe a similar situation later on in a better manner or at least with a little more insight of how to do something or what you should ideally do in that type of a situation. So as you can see here in this reflective practice section, you can go and add a new log. 
And there are a lot of different types of reflective practice that you can do. It can be a you know, leadership experience, a clinical event, teaching you've done, or even any sort of attendance to any organized teaching. So for instance, if you go to a Grand Rounds, oh, you're like, this topic was really interesting, you go ahead and create a reflective ticket when the teaching was, what it was called, how long it was for, summary of what happened, what you learned, and then where it happened. And that's it, it's pretty straightforward. All right, or if you want to get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty, you know, maybe you had some sort of leadership experience, talk about that, what happened, what you learned, the impact, and what you would do the next time. It takes you a little bit, I know that like, you've got to think a little bit about how you want to explain yourself and present yourself, but I'm telling you guys pretty soon, once you get into the habit of it, you'll be able to do it very quickly and you'll realize how important it is to do a reflective, or, or, or you know, to be a part of a reflective practice and to reflect pretty often. Soon it'll become like a second habit and you can also link these um, reflections then back to pertinent curriculum items. Now you've done all this stuff for your portfolio and you wanna see how you can track your progress. You wanna see how you can see how you're doing things and why you're doing the things that you're doing. So what you do there is if you go to progression, you can see your summary of progress in your IMT. This will cover a lot of little things that we'd already mentioned before in your ARCP decision aid. So mine right now obviously has got some of the input that I had from last year. If you see here, this is pretty much what it looks like when it'll be completed. I'll have stuff from my ES. I'll have you know some of these extra details filled out and some reports from different people. But basically, you know, if you're starting off with a clean slate, this is your opportunity to do things and then see how you are doing them. Like we talked about before about how many MCRs or MSFs you need to do or the different types of supervised learning events, taking again into account your decision aid and of course the curriculum towards what you need to be doing and how you need to be doing it. So it's a really good way for you to track yourself and see what you're doing because sometimes I think what ends up happening is you might send out a bunch of CBDs and you've realized you've actually not done enough you know, mini kexes, or maybe you've done a lot of mini kexes, but are not enough CBDs. And this is a good way for you to keep track of everything. And of course, make sure you're linking everything, because if you're not linking things appropriately, it's not going to do you any favors. A lot of the time you might be wondering how you can show all the learning or information that you've learned and how you can present it well in your portfolio. While I already mentioned stuff that you can put up in your personal library or things that you can reflect on, another really good way is to use this e-learning tab here. So I'm sure many of you know about the e-learning for healthcare or the ELFH website. Um, so if you go ahead and check it out there, you can actually link your portfolio to your ELFH um, account. And this would allow you to do a lot of different things and then you know show that you've completed them and link them to the relevant aspects of your competencies. So for instance, like if you see here, for here I've done on refeeding syndrome, if you check out what I've linked it to, I've linked it to managing an acute specialty related take because perhaps something in that topic was something that was related to this situation. You can always go and check the curriculum items or any other thing that would be related. It doesn't always have to be something that is clinical in this sense. Um, there are so many other things that ELFH has that you can look into. It's a good idea to use ELFH because obviously it's all following the guidelines and it's it's free. I mean, you have your GMC number, you can go ahead and access it. It's a really good way to learn about different different specialties or different topics that perhaps you're not too well aware of. Now we've talked about you sending out tickets to people and people completing those tickets, but that means obviously that people will be sending you tickets as well. They may be you know, juniors, they may be colleagues, they may be other individuals who may send you a ticket and want you to complete it. So obviously they will send it to you in a link in your email that you'd provided, but sometimes you might lose that email or perhaps you just wanna view it directly from the portfolio. So what you do is you go up here and from physician trainee, you switch yourself on to external assessor. So by going here, you can then see if there are any tickets for you to complete, or if you have a ticket code, you can put in that login code here and you would be set. Obviously try and complete your tickets as soon as possible so the person also gets the benefit of hearing back from you. But it's a good way, of course, to also make sure your details here are important. And as soon as you're done being an external assessor, if you wanna go back to your portfolio, again, you click here and you're back to being a physician trainee and you have your lovely dashboard of a portfolio. So there you have it, a little bit of a walkthrough, an introduction to your NHS ePortfolio for your internal medicine training. I really hope it was useful. I know there's much more that you can go into, but I think these are the most relevant bits and pieces that you need to know as a trainee when you're starting out. And I think this way you could at least get really familiar with what you need to know and how you need to do it. 
Guys, if there's still any other questions or concerns that you may have, please go ahead and comment below. And if you'll check in the description box, I've also left a feedback link. I would really appreciate any and all feedback you could give regarding this video that I've made today so that the next time I do something like this, I can make it a little bit better. And I really hope all of you enjoy your training as internal medicine doctors and I hope that as you progress through your training, you'll realize that the portfolio is something that you will come to love and cherish because it is where you can really show your capabilities. So good luck to everyone and thank you.